<laughs> hey, welcome to Fire Engineering's Hump Day Hangout to our show of issues and challenges in today's fire service. I'm Chief Rick Lassie, along with my buddy and Hump Day Hangout co-host, Louisville Assistant Chief Terry McGrath. And we've got another great one for you today with another great group. Um, uh, as a reminder, we always remind you, um, please, if you have any questions, shoot over to Twitter and uh, shoot them out to us. So just make sure you add hashtag FE Talk um, so we can get to it. I know a lot of you, I say this every time, I appreciate it. You send me messages and things like that, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my best. I miss a lot of them because I can't get to them. So if you do that, we can get to you uh, a little bit quicker. So, hey, today our topic is the fire tech knowing your weapon and where the water comes from. And we're, we're joined by a, a group of great folks here. Um, uh, we've got my, my teaching partner and my best buddy, Chief John Salka. Um, we've got Battalion Chief uh, uh, John Ashman from Louisville, a training chief there. Uh, he's joined by Engineer Mark Murphy from Louisville. Uh, obviously, my, my, my partner, Terry McGrath. And Chief Ryan Fetzer from uh, the Wichita West Fire Department, uh, right near next to my home. And uh, real quick, Ryan. Um, did you guys get the, the brush truck yet or no? We did. We took delivery of that new uh, Type 6 engine uh, last month. We're still getting some equipment on it. So hopefully next week or so it's going to go in service. We'll do a push-in ceremony uh, sometime in March. So oh, we'll very be pretty cool. much that as soon as we have it scheduled. Very cool. And and, my, and John Salka, John, uh, that uh, Ryan, we did the fundraiser. You donated the books. And uh, Mike Dugan, the, the signed photo. And we great. Did right. a great job just helping a little bit. Uh, they had some other great folks uh, chip Everybody in. Everybody helps a little bit. That makes it happen. <laughs> really appreciate it, John. Well, you know that, John. I mean, you're, you're the chief of your, your volunteer department. You, you, I've listened to you have to chase down bunker gear and radios <laughs> and things like that. Tell me about it. You know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have my Frio radios right now from place next door is buying all new all new portables, and we're getting their uh, they're five-year-old ones with the no good for them. So <laughs> always the good stuff. All right. So guys, we got Ryan, we got Terry, we got Mark, we got John, we got John, uh, Bobby. I'm hoping Bobby Halton joins us in a little bit, but, uh, and before we get started, uh, just want to remind you FDIC is right around the corner. Uh, go to FDIC.com. If you haven't registered yet, start registering, make sure you sign up for, uh, the classes John and I are doing on Monday. Uh, the, we're, we're doing our big room, uh, Wednesday, uh, in the evening. Uh, with, with Bobby Halton, Bill Gustin, John Norman, and John and myself called After Hours. Uh, uh, John, the perfect script for you and I. No That's script. <laughs> serving, no, are they serving beer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, for everybody who doesn't drink, especially us. But uh, but anyway, hey, guys, we want to talk about the, the fire tech and knowing your weapon and, and where the water comes from and uh, kind of a, a lot of different things smushed into an hour here about, uh, you know, uh, number one, can we begin our attack with, with tank water alone? Um, no one, the enemy, no one, you know, our flows. I've said this guys before, and uh, I want to throw this first one at, at John Ashman. Uh, John, I, I, I ran into someone, God, where was it? It wasn't just at the Teaks thing. It was somewhere else that big fan of yours. And you you must've taught him like a, a gazillion classes because he just went out about you. And, and, and I know why. Um, because you're a great guy uh, besides all the knowledge that you have. But we talk about knowing our enemy. Um, John, and I think you and I have talked about this before, you know, how many firefighters really don't know what comes out of the end of the nozzle? I just want to bring that up first to you guys. <laughs> you know, we go places and, and I'll, I'll, you know, guys will be showing you their pumper. And I'm like, okay, hey, cool. You know, all right, cross lay this and that, an inch three quarter. What kind of nozzles? And they tell me a double fangoli nozzle or something like that. And I'll ask us, so how much? How much water? What do you guys flow? And they all look at each other and then they start guessing. You know, I, I know with your teachings, you have to see that at the college and at work. I mean, you know, all over the place, right? It's kind of frustrating, isn't it? It pretty much is. It's in, kind of embarrassing that, you know, it's their main weapon. And you ask them, what do you have? And they go, I don't know. Does it work today? Uh, I think so. You know, did they check it out, you know. And then you ask them about their GPM flows on their different style structures they do. And they go. Well, you pretty much open the bell up, but we just hope we have enough water pressure that comes out of it. You know, and, and they work off the assumption that it's going to work every time. And if the situation changes, they don't know how to change it and make it work and adapt to what the new environment is. Well, and, 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 and Chief Salka, John, um, you and I have talked about this on some of our other shows and in some of our classes about, you know, knowing your tank size 
especially nowadays with the newer rigs and stuff like that. But, um, you know, let's tie that to knowing your weapon. Can we begin our attack? We use this in our company, Officer Cab, we say all the time, can we use, can we begin our attack with tank water alone? You want to address that real quick and or for a few minutes here? Well, I can't address it real quick, obviously. I know, that's why I just <laughs> <laughs> But, but as we all know, and as probably most of the folks that are listening know, there's so many factors that come into that decision. Uh, you know, and, and my first inclination always is to say, by golly, stretch a line, start water, and start fighting the fire. Not quite regardless of how much water you brought with you, but unless you're carrying around three or 400 gallons, you know, if you're carrying five, 750 or more, I mean, you've got a house fire, you've got a room of contents, get in there and start fighting the fire. Now, if, if you're looking for formulas and stuff, I'm the wrong guy. I'm sure there's other guys here that, that are a lot smarter than me on that. But the, the point is, most folks that don't want to start a fire attack right away, because maybe they don't have a, a hydrant system or whatever, or even a, or even a big tank, uh, most of them are worrying about running out of water. And, and you and I, Rick, have, have taught this and said this, and I'm sure you other guys have said it as well. Well, if you don't start fighting the fire with the water that you brought, you already ran out of water. You know, the results can be the same. Except, you, except you're starting a lot early. You're sitting there with water in the street, and this place is still burning. Obviously, you may have to go to, you know, hit it from outside to dock it down, or a couple of other alternate tactics. But my goodness, I can't imagine not throwing some water on on a place as soon as you get there, lo- long as you get enough to to do something with. Uh, you know, and it's a reasonable that you that you're using a, an attack line, not a two and a half inch line with a 400 gallon tank that's going to last like nine seconds. But sh- short of that. My my first inclination always is, yeah, let's start the attack. And and as you just said, knowing how much comes out of your line and how how often you're going to open it up and close it, and that all comes into the into the situation as well. You know? Well, and one of the, one of the things uh, you and I've talked about in class before, and we, we've said it plenty of times, Terry, on this show, is and and I did it. I remember doing a trophy club when I was interim there for a little bit. Um, you know, we we and I, I've said this story several times. We pulled up and. Well, great. One of the great captain, one of the captains, he was really concerned about getting, you know, their line laid to the hydrant. And I'm like, no, we got to get in there. I got another engine, bring you water. And later on, I, I asked a question. I said, what, what, what was, what was the hesitancy? He says, well, I was worried about running out of water. And, I'm, and John, like uh, you just said, I'm like, we, we don't, that's not car fire water. We didn't bring it for, we don't carry it for ballast. So we don't flip over the rig or driving around, the water. <laughs> you know, uh, and that, that's my buddy, John Salka's line anyway. But anyway, I just ripped that off from him. But but no, I said, so I, I do the whole the whole phone thing. And I think John uh, Ashman, you and I have talked about this on the show before. I've done the, w- with the cell phone. I said, all right, get your cell phone. I, first of all, how much water do we have? And they're like, well, we have 750 gallons of water. I said, okay, let's splash 50 gallons on the, on the street. What do we flow? And after we go around debating what do we actually flow out of, let's say, you know, pre-connect across the inch three quarter. Like, so how, ma- how many minutes do we have? And they'll say, well, at four. What I said, let's just go three. Let's just do three minutes. And, 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 and all right, I'm going to open the door for you. I'm going to open the door for you. Hit the hook, get there. All right, right now, you ready? Open the nozzle, boom. And I start, you know, we start to watch. And I'm like, okay. And or I usually have someone else doing it. And I'll just sit there and we'll talk. And I'm like, okay, so are we at a minute yet? They're like, no, we're at like seven seconds. I'm like, okay. Because I know you're in there just like this. You're in there just, you got the thing wide open. I mean, you know, you're just laying there, just spraying water continuously the whole time. You're not shutting it down, pushing up, shut, you know. Anyway, you know where I'm going with this. And, and after a while, it's almost humorous because we're sitting there and guys are chuckling. I'm like, where are we at? We had three minutes yet. Now we're at like, you know, 45 seconds. I think a lot of people don't realize just how much water they have um, uh, what, what, when, it, when it comes down to it. Murph, you, you, you've been driving a long time. You're also an acting, an acting captain. But as, as a driver, first of all, how important is it for, for your guys? I have two questions. How important is it for your guys to know their weapons, how much water they have that they're carrying, and, and more importantly, how long they have. You know what I'm saying? I mean, for them to be able to make that decision, you know, and you're out there and you're charging a line, um, you know, how, how important is it for them to know, know know their weapon? Well, I think it's very important. I think that a lot of guys don't understand, like just like you were mentioning a second ago, that, you know, three minutes is a long time and you can – you know, if we're going off of 750 gallons, you got three minutes. Uh, you can do a lot with uh, with that water in that short amount of time. And, and you know, two minutes into into uh, into a tank, and and you know, you still have quite a bit of water left, and you and you've done a lot of damage to the fire. Unfortunately, um, 
a lot of guys, people don't understand the the um, the time frame that uh, that we're talking about that it takes to put fires out. I mean, we can do we can do a lot with a little. And I think it's important to know uh, know what we have and and uh, know what our nozzles are doing and uh, the type of type of water that we're putting out with each line. You know what, uh, Chief? The every time I think about this, when I listen to the the old school podcast, which is kind of what brought my my thought to you about talking about this uh, a little bit in depth on this show, but I think you're water rich or you're water poor, and I say that because. Uh, in Louisville, we're water rich because we've got hydrants, we've got a robust water system, and we've got it. It's it's accessible to us. And I think Chief Fetzer could probably weigh in on the other side because as you get rural, you become water poor. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I just that's the reality, and that has to change how you function or or how you operate. Certainly in the first couple of minutes, I think one of the things that's real important around here. And so the other day we finished up three days of driver engineer interviews and more than one person that came through there used the phrase that one of their roles as a driver operator is to support the guys fighting fire. And I take exception to that because they're nothing without you. So they can go in and fight all the fire they want, but they're a hundred percent dependent on what you're doing out there and that your head is in the game, that you understand what your limitations are, but you also understand that, Connecting to positive water is probably the most important thing that has to be done in those first few minutes because once we connect to positive water, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. But getting back to the question you posed to, to Chief Adler, it's finding someone that really has a full, well-rounded comprehension of how this is all supposed to work. And so I don't like the notion that we're supporting someone because, listen, that medic finds a hydrant, that medic connects to that hydrant. Everything is dependent on what they do and that they do it in a timely manner. Fiber engineer disconnecting that five inch, getting it hooked up to the uh, to the uh, intake, and switching over from tank to positive water, making the announcement to the tank. You, every one of those steps is so crucial to a successful outcome and to the safety of the guys that are in there fighting fire. But I think it all fundamentally gets back to understanding number number one: understand your your lines, understand your nozzles, understand your flows understand what you got in the engine and that, you know, you do have to go into that with the first couple of minutes, kind of, you know, just with that in the back of your mind. But if everything, if everyone does their job and I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that phrase is that do your job and, and, and know what you're doing, do it efficiently and everything should fall in place. But I think that getting back to understanding your environment, when you get into that rural setting, like, like, like I referenced Chief Fetzer, there's a different, you know, things operate a little bit differently out there. And when you're going to have to set up drafting and, and tanks and, and, and you're relying on someone to bring water on the surface uh, to support an operation, things are different. But, uh, you know, I think it all starts with knowing what your environment is, knowing what your capabilities are and knowing what your job is and getting it done. And, and man, if you set up, get positive water, life is good. Well, and I'm glad, you, I'm, like, I'm glad you brought that up. And it's a great point, Terry, because too many people sell the driver, operator, driver, engineer, whatever you call them, chauffeur, that there was a responsibility sh short. It's like, well, I was just pumping. I've heard that before. We did an article for Bobby a long time ago, you know, the, dri the driver, operator, driver, engineer prepared for the role. And it was, it was, it was one of those where don't say I was just pumping at the fire because you weren't just pumping at the fire. You were, you were not supporting as much as you were an integral part of that, that crew. And hi, Bobby, how you doing? I want to say hi real quick. Um, Ryan, I want to throw to you, um, you before we went on, you know, you, you kind of, you kind of made a joke about, uh, uh, you know, about having so many hydrants versus so many miles of non hydrant you know, water, a lot like John Salka has to do in, in, in Orange County where you go from some hydrants, to having to bring your own water, um, big deal, you know, with the, and you've got some big ass homes and businesses that you have to bring the water to, don't you? We do. So we cover a 34 square mile area. And in that area, we have a total of 15 hydrants. So that's <laughs> real thing. Those hydrants are really grouped together in the areas they are. Your uh, these, water poor. <laughs> <laughs> and that puts a lot on whoever that initial IC is and stuff and getting those resources ordered, knowing what we have coming. You know, know what our trucks or our first use are doing. Uh, as Chief Salka mentioned, you know, there's times that as you get out there, 
you're going to make an attack with what you have on board, but it's a matter of what kind of attack you're going to do. So a lot of them may be hitting it hard from the yard or something else just until we feel we have enough to be able to send somebody into that house or uh, structure, whatever we're uh, fighting at the time. Uh, mutual aid agreements, knowing what other, you know, tenders are available in our area to get them started our way. It's going to be tanker shuttles, drafting operations, whatever we need to get set in place. Uh, very rarely are we going to be going, hey, we've actually got a plug over here we can tie into. Exactly. John, you got something? Yeah. And, 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 the, and like everybody's saying, there's a common theme uh, amongst all these comments about this is, and it comes back down to training. Somebody already said it, know your job. You know, like the folks in Orange County or the folks in, in rural Alabama or, you know, Tallahassee, Florida, or wherever you are, whether you're water rich or water poor, it's not a secret. You don't open an envelope when a run comes in and say, holy cow, we don't have any hydrants. You know, like you already <laughs> knew that. So that's why there's a lot of places here with LDH and large tanks and, and tankers with 2,500 gallons on them. You, you got to go into operation right away and take care of the stuff that you got to take care of. If, if you're hydrant rich and you got a lot of water, you know, you just drop a line and roll it in and the next thing he's going to stop or you drop a guy back there and he connects and gives you water and, and off you go to the races. So everybody's in a different situation. But if, you, if you're trained up on it, if you know what you got, you know what you don't have. If you know water supplies is, is, a, is a challenge. Some places it's not a challenge at all. You got a hydrant, you lay a line and, and off you go. Other places, it's probably the most important tactic. And it might be the one that takes the most manpower to get done at the whole fire. Not even putting the fire out, but getting the water to the scene. So, you know, training and being ready and being up on what you're supposed to do and getting your job done is, you know, all plays an important role in in water supply. Exactly. And Bobby, you know, you you worked you worked forever in Albuquerque, all the way up through through just about every rank there. Um, oh, every rank. Except- with yep. the exception of the, the the chief, you made every rank, and you went from a place where they sprinkle water and fire hydrants pop up everywhere to now, you know, you're 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 working with a volunteer department with some great volunteers in Oklahoma. But the same thing that John sees in in Orange County and Ryan sees, you go from some hydrants to no hydrants, and you know that has a, I'll just say it, it, it does have an impact on how we go about committing and, and to what, how far, depending on what we've got burning and how much is burning and, you know, response times and so on and so forth. Because, uh, you know, again, you're, you're in another place where you can go from maybe a small little shotgun house to some McMansions and some big ass buildings and have to be bringing water in. So it, it's time and training are both of the essence, right? Uh, absolutely. We got this uh, um, hillbilly troubadour who lives a couple of miles from us, uh, a guy named Garth Brooks. Um, anyway. <laughs> He, he built a he built a couple a series of double wides and, and, and stacked them um, McMansion style and uh, you can tell it's his house because he's got you know uh, radial tires on top most of us just have double you know single ply and double ply but he went all out and threw radials up there but uh, so but what's fascinating about working out here is we got a lot of good tankers that that you know 2,500 gallons like John said we got a couple of those. And one of the things we've gotten really proficient at is tapping a plug with those bad boys and then bringing them out to do our drop tanks off of those. And, and that's worked out really, really well for our shuttle operations out here is that, you know, we kind of take advantage of the fact that we don't always have to draft, you know, we don't always have to set up a draft situation off a pool or a pond or, you know, a, a nearby stream or something. We can just tap into a plug. So we're kind of fortunate in that way, but you're right. In our, in the district that we cover, and of course, with all our mutual aid, you could be in a neighborhood that's got, you know, a plug every couple of blocks and you could be in a neighborhood that doesn't have a hydrant for a mile and a half, two, three, four miles. So, you know, you just everybody knows it, though. You know, everybody, everybody. One of the, one of the things you learn early on through the system is, is where it is and where it isn't. But I'll tell you, I always <clears throat> one of the things that just I, I remember from my early days and it was, it was a Tommy line, John, you probably Ricky, you've heard Tommy say this a million times. Don't ever trust anybody to get you water. You know, always, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you're passing a plug in a municipal setting or a hydrogen setting and you're, you're, you, you know, you're going to count on somebody else to bring you water, that was your first bad move. You know what I mean? Uh, always make sure that you've got, the, you know, if you've got a plug, tap it. You know what I mean? That the chauffeur can do it on their own, the driver, the engineer, whatever you call them. That, that, that most, most of those folks can handle, you know, hand jacking it to the plug if they have to. Or, or enlisting a couple of volunteers if they have to from the from the looky loos and the wannabes. Um, so that's always an opportunity. But if uh, if you have the opportunity to tap a plug in your first do, 
tap that plug, you know, make sure you get a connection, have, 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 make sure you've got your own water, if at all possible. If you, if you don't have that luxury, obviously then good communication, good shuttle operations are key. And, and there's a, you know, there's a lot to it. You know, I, I learned a lot out here with these guys, like that we have the, the, the fast drop, you know, that um, on the back of our drop tanks, we can, we can drop practice that whole load. And I think like five minutes, it's phenomenal to see that much water coming out of that thing. And then we can also gate it down if, if, you know, if, if we don't have the, if we don't want to drop it all fast. So uh, I, I, I'm very fortunate to be working with these guys and, and, and the surrounding folks that we mutual aid with and uh, a lot of respect for the talent they have at, at securing water and getting water early. And then to Terry's point earlier, I was listening to Terry speaking, you know, where you put it matters also. You know what I mean? Um, it was funny years ago, we had a hydrant operation in Albuquerque of all places. We rolled out and uh, a plug operation and I got there kind of early. I was the, the, I think I was a, maybe a battalion chief at the time or an acting battalion chief years and 20, 25, 30 years ago. Anyway, the house is on fire. For some reason, I find myself inside with the hand line crew and the kids kind of doing this, right? Tapping it, you know, doing this and this. And I says, what are you doing? He goes, well, we're on tank water chief. And I don't want to run out of water. I said, son of 500 gallons fast doesn't do the trick. 500 slow ain't the freaking answer. <laughs> you know what I mean? So learning how to handle your water inside or even outside, that's also a key part of the, uh, of the process. Well, and, and I want to, I want to throw that part. One of the things you said, Bobby, about, you know, not passing or, you know, ensure you get your own water. John, you talk about all the time. You bring up Willie Tracy and, and you always talk about, you know, now not everybody has this. We're talking about rural operations and, you know, more urban than that. But every time, if, if you're in a hydrated area, every time the wheels of the pump are stopped, it stopped where? Every time. That rig never, ever stopped anywhere other than a hydrant. And I'm telling you, on medical calls and emergencies and car accidents, didn't matter what we were going to, when that rig stopped, I get out, I trip over a hydrant. There'd be a hydrant there. That, it's the only thing he knew. And I'll tell you what, it was a very valuable habit. It was great because we were always prepared. We come out of a medical call, a medical call, and there'd be a wet spot next to the hydrant. Not only did he park there, but he tested the hydrant on a medical call. And, and guys, guys, you know, guys that used to come and ride with us now and then would be like, did he check the hydrant on a medical call? I said, yep, he's, he's an engineer. He's a chauffeur. He knows how important water is. He checked more hydrants in a 24-hour shift, I think, than, than a lot of guys check on hydrant inspection in three hours, you know? Well, you, you've said that before about no one, and, 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 and uh, Chief Ashman, John, you remember when we had John Salka come out to Lewis a long time ago, and I, I say this in class, he embarrassed a lot of our drivers because he talked about Willie Tracy and how he checked more hydrants in a shift than some guys do in their career or in a whole year. And that whole thing, every time the rig stopped, they're, th they're, they're third due, you know, an alarm at the hospital. It's two in the morning and he's checking a hydrant. They're going to come back from a call and he pulls over, he makes the probie come out and check the hydrant, know which wrench to grab. And John, if you remember, you know, how many, all of a sudden it was funny because all of a sudden we had all these broken hydrants in Louisville. The water department was panicking. I got kind of chewed out by the, you know, and I'm like, they didn't just break now. And, and I'm, and I'm looking, you know, to, towards, you know, John Ashby, after Salka, after John Salka said that, it was like, all of a sudden now, because it was before, it's like, well, I didn't have anything showing any of a fire. And I'm like, it's an automatic fire alarm, whatever. Why are you not checking a hydrant? We're nothing without water, right? I mean, nothing. They nothing. took it all for granted. You know, it's you're told that there's water and the systems work, and they took it for that. You know, a lot of them, you know, didn't have the experience or the years when, you know, some of the cities were having issues and they couldn't keep up. And, you know, you had to make sure that the water systems work. Uh, we were extremely fortunate the city had money and they did the maintenance but then all of a sudden you challenge them and they go out there and they find out that some of the stems are broke some of the threads are off you know the weep holes were, were were clogged and they just kept the waters in the barrel and then when they realize that hey it, it's a piece of machinery and over time it will break you know you put into it whatever you want and the only way you can find out it, that it's broke is going out and actually putting hands on it well and, and murph being a driver um, you know, we, we know how important it is. Obviously we just mentioned it to make sure we, our hydrants are good. And when we always say I'm on a hydrant, doesn't mean I'm just sitting in the hydrant it means we're in, we got water, we know it's good. So on and so forth. Let's change gears a little bit. How important is it? And I, again, I know you act up as a captain, but as a, from the driver engineer's perspective to keep your company officer, to keep the interior crew, that first crew, if you're on tank water, let's go back to tank water. How important is it? 
to keep them informed where you're at water wise? Well, I think it's very important. I think they need to know if we're getting low, that they need to know that, that we're at a critical stage. Um, you know, as an engineer, it's, you know, it's, we take a lot of responsibility on our shoulders as out there making sure that the water, we're, we have good water, making sure that the tank is, if it's getting low, that we're letting the crews inside, um, even letting command know, letting operations know that we're, where we're at with the water situation. In Louisville, and I'll touch on what Chief McGrath was talking about, is that, you know, we're water rich here. So as engineers, we're used to being able to let our crews go a little bit further than, than what we would if we were in a situation to where we were uh, water poor. Um, but it is, a, it is a huge responsibility that we have to make sure that we're staying on top of that. Um, you know, uh, we have hydrants. It, it seems like, you know, it, he was talking about having, what did he say, 30, uh, 15 hydrants and a 30 miles. Uh, we have 15 hydrants in three quarters of a mile. I mean, it's, and so for us, it's, uh, we have hydrants right across the street at, at just about every turn. So. Well, it, again, it goes back to, you know, if I'm inside, I, I, the first thing I should hear from my driver is, Hey, you're down to a quarter tank. I, I should have heard some things before right. that. And, you know, and, and again, knowing what we've got, where it's coming, um, and I, I'm looking at Ryan and John Salka and Bobby, because all three of you do rural operations as well as, as you know, with hydrants, that coordination, it's even more so. And, and, and let me back that up real quick. There, I know departments that have no hydrants, not a hydrant in town and can get better water and more water than some departments in urban settings. You, I've had guys go, you just give me a crick, whatever. I took my <laughs> a crick one. You just give me a you give me a crick and I'll get you water all day. And oh my God, they put even so they stick a little, they get one of their little. Is that a Texas? Things. Is that a Texas accent? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> What's it right? I mean, you say give me a, give me a crick, give me a creek. I mean, these guys will pump water all day long, and and, and there's some other folks that can't get a hydrant open. You know, don't know where it's flowing, don't know how to back it up or whatever, so on and so forth. So that's my first you thing. You got to remember, Ricky, when we're doing our hillbilly hand fishing, you know, when we're going for those catfish <laughs> in, in the river, we're scouting those opportunities so that our strainers will have adequate reach. And here in Oklahoma, we're actually famous for that. We're doodling. And occasionally you pull out a copperhead, which doesn't have a good ending, but <laughs> nine times out of 10, it's a catfish. <laughs> but you know the other thing to think about, and Ricky made me think about what we were talking, and, and John, you know, a great, great illustration of what a good engineer will do. Always spot on the plug. But even to further that point, the art of you know flushing your your, your plugs. I mean, really flushing your plugs. You know, uh, <clears throat> routinely, right. we've kind of lost that. And and I, I've been the unfortunate um, recipient of, of of a major fire where we had a ton of debris come through. The, the, the lines and uh, disable two towers. And uh, it did not go well from that point forward while we reconfigured everything. And uh, you know, flushing a plug, really, I mean, really flushing it, not just cracking it to make sure you got water, letting that son of a gun, you know, throw some water for a few minutes. You know, I go some places and I hear people saying, well, you know, we're not really allowed to do that because uh, people complain about us wasting water or people complain about damage to the vegetation around it and stuff. You've got to, you've got to open those things up, especially if there's been some construction or a new home has been put in or a business because the what right. the debris gets in those lines when they, when they open them up and work on them and, and you'd be astonished at the amount of, of garbage that's in there. And once that gets into your impeller and into your pumps, or especially if you got you know fog tips on, on some of your devices, it's game over. You're done. Well, and, and making sure too. Let's let's throw this part in there. Um, seek out seeking out a second source as well, depending on the level of your fire at. You know, I've 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 shown plenty of pictures. If you go to Gordon Nord or Timmy Oak's pictures from Chicago, the 211 engine, the first second alarm, if you will, engine 211 in Chicago, the very first engine, they actually hit a hydrant in Chicago, the land of water. All right, they hit a hydrant with hard suction. If you ever seen those pictures, if you ever see any pictures from Timmy Oak or from Gordon Nord at a, at, a, at a 211 or higher, see a pumper, look closely. If you see their hard suction to a hydrant, that, that is almost always a second alarm engine. They bring it up to the street. 
So, so again, and I know Louisville and Terry and John and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. I know when I was there, the, the, the first, the, the, the first engine on the second alarms, absolute priority was to find a second source, you know, to make sure we had two different locations mm -hmm. for water. Um, you know, no one where that can, is that still, is that still what we're looking at for the first two engine or the first second alarm engine, first one or the second? Yeah. And the idea is to get the water supply to it. And the second is usually when they're far off 400, 800 foot away, that they just don't do it under static pressure that they're now being told, Hey, go to the engine, go to the hydrant and pump back. So if we're in a older part of town, yeah, we have water, but after 800 feet, we're going to lose the friction loss and you're not going to get the, the adequate flow that you need. So we need to put the lines back under power, um, you know, which was some of the stuff that, yes, we had water, but once you got the deck gun up or two, three cross legs, your residual will drop down to 20. Now you go down there and whatever is under the, water, the ground in the water main, the potential for water flow, we're actually taking it out of the main and pushing it down to the hydrant to use for the attack instead of getting half the GPM. Right. And I don't want I don't want some of our, our viewers to think, you know, we're playing down the fact that, well, we could do everything with tank water. We could do everything with a, pre, you know, two and a half gallon pressurized water can by no means. There's a lot of damage you could do with those. It's we are nothing. We are nothing without water. And, and Chief Salk, I think you had something I cut you off before. Yeah, You know, you know, what's interesting is um, like like they were just saying, it's almost like there's two separate operations underway. You know, the guys up at the front on the rig, the captain, the nozzle guy, or whoever, however many people you have jumping off the rig, going to work, fighting the fire. And then you got the engineer, first two engineer, maybe the, in the FDNY will be the second two engine. That, their job is to come right in and augment, augment the first engine, make sure they got their line, you know, in place. They got a supply line. If they don't, they, they help them get it in place. They're not concerned with anything that's going on at that fire. Those two, those two engineers are running back and forth, touching stuff and grabbing stuff and tightening stuff and loosening stuff and, they can be guys jumping out windows. They're not even looking. They're taking care of water. And that's what you need. You need people that are focused on what their job is rather than everybody being, you know, running around like moths to the light bulb. Sometimes a little action starts happening. Everybody goes running over there. They all want to take part in it. And there's a rig sitting there, you know, idling with, with nobody at the pump panel. So like, like some of the other guys already said before from Louisville, you get them good engineers like Willie Tracy, my guy, like your guys in Louisville. That, that's what you need. You need people that are serious about what they're doing and, and not only know how to do it, <clears throat> know how to troubleshoot it, even with these new modern engines with all this new fangled crap all on them instead of the regular old-fashioned valves. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> the point is that's what you got. You got to work with what you got. Somebody's got to figure that stuff out. And, it, you know, that you, you need that crew out there. And like Rick said, like the rest of us said, it, there's nothing more important. Maybe, maybe it's as important to, to have a good nozzle team but there's nothing more important to have a good team outside getting water, whether it's the folder tank and, and tank is coming by and dumping into it, whether it's an LDH going down a block or whatever it might be. Yeah. Well, and now, Chief, go ahead. Go ahead Lasky, so the last, the last two, the, the two bigger fires that I've been involved in, but in both instances, um, water supply, because we had multiple companies or, or multiple large lines flowing with aerial operations, things like that. Water supply became a, a it's, it's a lot more complicated than what your bread and butter is going to be. So we're extremely efficient at pulling up in front of a house, being able to use the 750 gallon tank water and transition to a hydrant. And we're extremely efficient at that. But then when you get outside that, that low frequency, high risk kind of thing, right? So we go, the, the last big fire, a commercial fire, which was a large department store unsprinkled uh, building, but and of course, we're real fortunate because when, when Chief Ashman shows up, unfortunately, he gets pigeonholed because he's my water guy. <laughs> fire. I mean, we had a lot going on, but water was a major problem. And as it turned out, right, we're hitting a lot of the same hydrants that are in the same grid. And so, you know, we're, we're robbing from one another. But when we transitioned to go, and, and at one point we had three, three uh, tower ladders going at one time. Well, when John showed up, I said, hey, figure this out because I've got an engine calling saying, man, I'm below residual. I've got another engine calling and asking for more water. What can you supply? You know, things like that. And so because of the, the, the speed at which that fire ramped up so quick, right, we're not maybe as calculated, but we're hitting the first thing we see. So get a hydrant. Well, they're getting a hydrant. Well, as it turned out, you know, we kind of we kind of did it to the detriment of our own operations. But you know what? In, in 15 minutes, John going around and, and we have the ability to access 
technology in our, in our cabs, even on our phone, of looking at mains and looking at what's connected. But within a matter of minutes, John has it figured out where now we reposition an engine, put him someplace else, get him across the street, get him on a different, a different uh, source, and then pump back. But the, the level of anxiety of that fire uh, went from uh, a pretty anxious few moments to like, all right, we got a handle on this thing now. And you know what? It, you throw all the water that you want out the end of a nozzle, but when the guys that are running those pump panels or the guy that's sitting in the, in the, in, in, in operations or instant command, and he's listening to the traffic, listening to each one, you know, kind of explain what their problems are. Solving those problems brings a whole lot of calm to that incident. And, uh, and I liken that to like when, when I say John gets always, he always gets assigned water because he understands it. He's passionate about it and he figures it out. Um, it's nothing. It's it's the same thing I see when I've gone the few times that I get to go to some kind of a rural uh, incident uh, in Denton County. But when you watch them set up multiple tanks, but they always have somebody right there that's coordinating all of it. And it's like a it's like an orchestra watching the whole thing. And uh, and, you know, that's kind of what led me to, to, to really place a lot of emphasis on using on a large scale fire. We've had an apartment complex or a commercial fire but is to identify somebody and, and get him over that part of the operation uh, to make sure that we're not missing anything or, or we don't run into a problem. Well, and, and Ryan, I've watched you guys <clears throat> out here, um, both at structure fires and with some big wildland jobs. And I've never not seen you have a water supply. Off. I mean, it's, I, in fact, you guys are pretty good at what you do. I think it's because you have to do it all the time, but uh, the, the key to having somebody coordinating that for you, especially we have a lot of departments around here, small, where they're, they're single station, you know, like it's not like we've got 20, you know, 20, 20, 20 station departments coming to you. It's a station 17. It's like, we're sewing together a whole bunch of different places that come in from all over. So the coordination, especially for the water supply officer is huge, isn't it? It is. So that's, you know, having those mutual aid agreements, knowing like within our County, what equipment each department has. So we know which departments call for to get that equipment we need. Uh, you know, who has the dump tanks if we need to drop the tanks on the ground or can we just get enough tenders and uh, rotation that, you know, we can just fill off the tenders and not have to drop the tank on the ground. Uh, we usually, when we get on a large scale incident, we'll assign a staging manager and part of their staging manager's responsibility is that water supply, you know, making sure he knows where the tender is and how much water they have available, you know, who's coming in to replace him when he needs to go refill or, you know, it's again, point we need to put a tank on the ground. Uh, you remember last year we had the, uh, pipeline had the five million gallon fuel tank that caught on fire. Right, that was a huge deal. Huge. They had one hydrant that was closed. Uh, now this was a city operation and stuff. They called in all of us from the surrounding departments to bring our tenders there. We had probably twenty tenders on site because they're expecting to have to do a huge amount of water shuttling to bring it onto the site. There, uh, they went through. They identified two different hydrants we were going to use on completely separate grids, so we weren't tying down just one grid. We had multiples going there. Uh, the valve set up, 10 tenders assigned to each group, and the plan was if we had to utilize it, we knew exactly how the rotation was going to go, come back up into multiple dump tanks on the ground or daisy chain together, so you could suction off of one and it pulled from all four tanks at a time. Well, and, and I think something that a lot of people, hang on one sec, John, I, th I think something a lot of people have gone away from, and, and I, I talk about when it comes to truck stuff, there's some old school truck stuff and old, old school engine stuff that people have kind of done away with, but one is the nurse engine, and I'm not talking about we pull up and we're nursing off a, a tanker pump or a, a tanker or a tender. I'm talking, you got your porta tank, you got everything going. You know, you've got all these other pumpers that pull up that aren't doing anything. It's parked on the side. Some with 500, 750 gallons of water, 1,000 or whatever. But let's say 750, you know, I think a lot of people are forgetting to do the whole clamp, run, run a, you know, a couple of two and a half or two and a half down, to, you know, off in the ditch. And you've got, you know, two of those pumpers. You got a driver just sitting there, two of those that are ready to go. And if, if, if the water supply or somebody sees the operator sees that they're getting low and we're a little delayed getting our shuttle back or our next tanker tender, whatever you call it, they can ask for them to nurse the tank. So you don't lose your draft. So you dump your tank water from your pumper in there, raise it up. So you don't lose your draft when they're done. Boom. You take off. The next guy pulls up. He connects to the two and a half or three inch. That way you've got a backup to the backups. You're not going, you're not calling, you know, Lieutenant Salka say, I got to back you on, I'm running out, you know, whatever. And this whole back and forth that we do sometimes, I think a lot of people have, have just kind of 
given up on that idea. And I think it's, you got, again, you got all these pumpers sitting on the street, running off line back there to where you can have one or two of them sitting there. And then when they take off, they find their own supply or they get, they get cut. They get cuts. They cut for everybody else, Philip, because they're your safety engine, if you will, water-wise. John, you had something talking? Yeah, and that, and that brings you right back to what the chief was saying a couple of minutes ago about having somebody, you know, somebody on it, somebody assigned to coordinate and supervise and watch the whole water supply operation. I did that many times here in South Bloom and Grove, where I'm, you know, in the volunteers. I call mutual aid, tell Salbury Mills chief, you're the water supply guy, you got it. That's the last time I say the word water at the fire. You know, that guy jumps on it. You know, they'll call me up. One time a guy even called me and said, I, I, I think I'm going to need to add another tanker to the, you know, to the circle. We're running a little. I said, just you order what you want. You get what you want and do what you want. And so that being said, and, and I hate I hate talking all the time about the engineers and all that, but but I still think the engineers, I still think the guys behind the wheel, the guys operating the pump panel, whether you're urban, I mean, my, my guys, not just Willie and 48 engine, but, you know, in a squad or wherever else I worked, the guy knew on the left-hand side of Main Street was a 48-inch main, and on the right side was a 24-inch main. He knew that. He knew that every day. So when we had a big job, I'd be like, there's a hydrant right there. Well, he, nope, he'd go across the street. Got a 48-inch main over here, Cap. And for the volunteer guys that don't have hydrants, they got tankers or tenders, they, they know that Cutterback Bill's got the 3,000-gallon tanker. So don't call Washington with the 1,500. Call, you know, everybody's got to – it just comes back to being into it and knowing what you're doing and being aware of your hydrant, you know, your main sizes and your – your tankers or tenders, where they're coming from, how far they are, and what they're carrying. And Bobby, you mentioned in the chat bar a little bit of main sizes before. Um, you know, you you you're obviously all over the place besides running FDIC and all these other conferences. Uh, and I and I know you got something. I want to throw this out there as well to you. I know you and I've talked about this as well as pretty much everybody on this panel about how frustrating it is. I love YouTube. I love watching the fires and seeing what people are doing. And you know learning and all that stuff and not being critical like some people, being constructive, not destructive. But Bobby, I've said it a bunch of times. I know you have. We're so busy jumping out of helicopters or carabiners that we can't we can't stretch the initial attack line anymore, it seems, or get water to the end of a nozzle. I mean, right? We we you know you see you see the video and here comes the pumper and you know, hey, we've all been there, you're waiting, and here it comes and they pull up and you're going and you're counting it and and, and you're going, what's taking so long? I mean, you know, Put it in park, gear, gear, you know, boom, boom. You know, there's very few things you got to do, as Mark would do, to, to be ready to go. And it's almost kind of embarrassing to see sometimes. I, I guess from your aspect, wh wh is it just a training issue? Is it a leadership issue? Is it both that we need to get back to stretching hose? Most important thing on the pumper is the water and hose. I, I'm sorry. It is the most important thing. Well, two things. And kind of dovetails as to what I wanted to say a second ago. And, and you're right. And John nailed it. Knowing your main sizes is critical. Now, you know, we have folks that, you know, in, in some of our major metropolitan departments, we have folks that don't even live in the city anymore. They come in from surrounding areas. And, and the new model for fire departments is that these men and women move around a lot. It's just the way it is. It's not right or wrong or good or bad. We used to have real crew integrity where a crew is a crew and pretty much you rode with the same people every day. That's that that model has changed for, for a wide variety of reasons. We're not, I'm not going to get that conversation, but that's why systems like, you know, bits where you can get the information in an instant as to what the mains are so that the officer as they're riding out can tell the driver, the chauffeur, the engineer, Hey, we, we got, we got a, a 48 on this side. We got a 12 on this or eight on this side. So that that's a really important point. The other thing that you raised, Ricky, I think is really critical. And, and let me frame it this way. Some of our systems now allow people to, um, you know, go through school somewhere, at, you know, the University of, of Happy Land, and then come in and join the department as a, a chief of this or a chief of that or a captain or whatever, bypassing, you know, firefighter rank, senior firefighter, engineer. I think the engineer, and I know many organizations allow people to bypass it, is probably one of the most critical experiences you're ever going to have as a firefighter. Also, it's going to be one of the most important pieces of information to have in your hip pocket as an officer, because the nuances and the complexity and the amount of time it takes to do some of those tasks is really, really important to understand. You know, you, you can't just snap your fingers and say, hey, I want you to give me water to two lines and a deck gun and, you know, it, it, like that. You've got to. I do that all the time, Bobby. I do that all the time. I snap my fingers and say that <laughs> and it happens. <laughs> I swear to God. 
I'm going to join the club and beat you over the head with this. <laughs> so anyway, but when you think about it, there's several other aspects of it. When you do that job, like Ryan has and, 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 and everybody here in this group, you also understand that a drop tank isn't just a drop tank. There's different kinds of drop tanks. And depending on the way your roads are set up, like out here, we've got a lot of one lane rural roads where we need to make sure that we can put that drop tank on an incline because th that's the only way to do it. Otherwise, we can't get apparatus in or out. We basically, you know, if we put the drop tank down, we, we're, 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 that's it. That's the end of the road. That's the deal. So having that kind of knowledge as an officer, when you're going out to make purchases or you're going to do drill, you can understand that we've got different, we, we do different drop tanks for water supply, depending on what kind of road we're on, where we're at. And all of that is predicated on that experience of being the man or woman responsible, as John said, for, for being that operator, <laughs> irrespective of what you call them. I don't care if you call them the Lord High right. Commander of the Engine. But whatever you call it, give a damn. But I don't think that that's a step in the process that you should be allowed to bypass it if you're going to be a, a functioning officer in that organization. Now, that's just my opinion. But when, when I ran Albuquerque as the deputy chief, I was able to you know, put that down as in blood. And, and you know, there were folks that hated me for, oh, I don't like to drive. Oh, I don't really care. Learn to love it. Embrace the stuff. <laughs> so... You know, if you want friends, get a puppy, learn to drive. <laughs> so, right. And what are we doing hiring people that can't drive for God's sakes? Anyway. Um, anyway. That's a whole other topic. <laughs> That's a whole other topic. So there's, there's a couple of things to take away here, right? For good officers, good, good chiefs, good, good leaders go through all the ranks, but especially the critical ranks engineer. Now you may not have to be an arson investigator. You may not have to be a, you know, a, a fire marshal or what that, which is valuable, really, really valuable. I'm not discounting it. But if you're going to be in operations, you damn well better know how to handle a pump and you damn well better know how to set up a ladder. You damn well better know how to, you know, spot for a good scrub area. And what's the difference between a rear mount and a mid mount? If you don't know that stuff, then you don't know what you're doing. And, and, and then I can't help you. But the, the, the conversation we're having today, probably I, I agree with Rick and John. Probably the most critical conversation you can have in the American Fire Service is the ability to, to access, maintain, and deliver water. The, the fundamental doctrine of the American Fire Service is the effective application of water on the seat of the fire, period. Everything else is freaking moonshine and, and gypsy bullshit. You're exactly, exactly right. And, and, and uh, again, you know. Bobby, are you saying that truck guys don't do crap? Oh, God. Well, you know, I'm not saying that exactly, but you know, I, the other day, I, the other day I saw them in a fire beating the fire out with the with the 24 footer, very effective, very effective. Hey, Murph got transferred to a truck. I just brought him onto this show. I'm trying to raise his his credibility. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, and, and Chief, <laughs> Chief Chief Ashman, what what do you got, buddy? Like I said, we talk about water supply, and we talk about you know <laughs> these are all part of the new drivers. Hey, you, you use onboard water and make the transition as fast as you can to the hydrant. And then that's all we teach them, you know, back and forth. But they don't think, you know, sometimes outside the stuff or, like you said, the different parts of districts or part of the counties that you go to. And it brings up the one that, you know, you were on that big, um, what, mansion hotel that they had on the lake that time. And we, it was a water supply problem on that. And they're sitting there going, yeah, we, we got water solved. It's coming. And we said, what do you mean it's coming? We have this tanker coming. They got a new tanker. It's 3,500 gallons. Well, it's going to take them 40 minutes to get here. Yeah, but when that 3,500 gallons gets here, we're going to be good. <laughs> we got two fire boats that are sitting right there. Why aren't we using them? Yeah, but they only get 500 gallons a minute. We'll do the math. Both boats is 1,000 times the 30. We get 35,000 gallons of water going by the time the tanker gets here. And when it gets here, it only has 3,500. You know, so we, we don't look sometimes outside the box, you know. Well, it's the fire boat. Why are we take it to a structure fire? It's a water supply issue. Or we bring the brush trucks out to the rural part of town for a house fire. Well, why are you bringing that for? Well, we've got these two floating pumps that'll flow 150 GPM, and they got this thing in the backyard, you know, a concrete pond, a swimming pool. <laughs> or you have an above ground, you, you know, like, the mansion, like in Oklahoma has. <laughs> you got them 24 foot ovals. There's 15,000 gallons of water you sit there. 
throw the float and pump in there, that's 150 times two, 300 gallons of water that you're filling your drop tanks with. But we're waiting for these big, heavy tankers to go down country roads to go get fine water and bring it back to you. When at the same time, I can be giving you 300 gallons to supplement the tanks and keeping them full while the tankers are shuttling back and forth. But sometimes we don't think outside of those little boxes is, hey, I got water in this big tanker. I'm waiting for it coming. Well, and it goes back to how we were suction in it. Exactly. It goes back to what we're saying is knowing your enemy and knowing your weapons, the weapons you have available to you, like Ryan was saying, knowing who's coming from where and I may, you know, and, and get them coming earlier. I was, I was half joking, but I was very serious when I've had those departments talk about the whole Crick Creek thing, stick a little big. I mean, I'm telling you, they, they just drive off. They're down in this ditch by this Creek, the Creek, this river or whatever. And they're, they're pumping water and there's for, for like days, nobody's, nobody's, nobody's running out of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Where we got some other people that don't even know what comes out of the end of their hydrants. And I want to throw this at Mark before we run out of too much uh, time here. Mark, I know you guys are big out at Louisville. Talk to us about the communication. I hear it on the radio all the time I had when I was there between the drivers. You know, your first two, you're, you're out there, you're out at sixes today, right? And a lot of big ass buildings and big houses and stuff. Having your second due coming, I mean, how critical is it for those, for, for, for your partner that's bringing the other engine, you're driving today, you know, to communicate? It's very critical. I'll tell you what, if it, it's very reassuring knowing that we have other we have other pieces of equipment coming. And when we hear another engine check on scene, we know within a few seconds I'm gonna have another driver standing right beside me and helping me get the hydrant and helping me get up and get more lines. Um, Chief was talking a while ago about um, having multiple people when you got two or three engineers outside doing the, doing water duties and there's other stuff going on, but those two or three engineers having constant communication with each other, knowing what's going on. You know, if you're in a relay or even a tandem situation and those engineers staying in contact with each other is, is huge. Um, it, it's a game changer. Oh, and have, having a, like I said, having a partner, it's no different. Than, and, and I'll, you know, everybody here uh, with exception of Mark, cause he's a driver engineer, you know, plays the incident commander role. It's nice. I, there's a lot of people like to run things by themselves, and I've always welcomed having other bosses there, having having someone I could turn to go, oh, crap, Terry, and Terry's, I'm on it, or whatever, or you know, and just having having a think tank, if you will. Same thing goes for the driver operators, the engineers, to have that think tank, to have buddies. You know, how many times you pull up and you're off to the side, and you know the attack crew is going to walk down, and the driver takes off down the street to help the first do whatever what they've got going. You know. I think that partnership is huge. And again, you know, Bobby emphasized to John, Ryan, everybody, Terry, the importance of knowing our systems, knowing our weapons, but but more importantly, knowing where the water comes from or the sustainable water, whether you're dropping a bunch God. of tanks or a hydrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Know, knowing and knowing what you could do with it, you know, and, and, and I'll go back to this. It's all fun. It's all fun to, yeah, and I love the videos. I love watching the videos. But unless you get out and put your hands on stuff, unless you go out there and stretch hose and stretch hose, and, and I, I guess I'd like to end things with that too, is talking about the actual fire attack. Um, you know, and, and John, you've got you've got an engine company in the Bronx that has a, they built a, they welded, they built a hose bed in the back of the firehouse where, where the guy's, they, 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 this way they're not messing with the engine per se, but they have their loads on this. They can stretch hose in the firehouse, you know, without taking an engine out of service. Again, it goes back to, God, how quick can you get the line off the rig to where you're going? Everything else depends on how fast we do that and how efficient we are doing that and knowing our shit. Right, John? And no. Go ahead, John. I, I got you. I got you. Uh, Yeah. Go ahead, John boy. But yeah, like I said, when you get the hose on there, you know, the faster you get on there, the better everything gets. And it goes back, like we talked about earlier with the nozzles, how much water are you flowing? How much are you going to put out? But what the guys don't realize is not only we're not just putting the fire out or darkening it, but all that extra water that's hitting the couch, hitting the carpet, hitting the fabric, it's wetting it down. So the fire goes down, the material around it is wet. It's going to take more heat to ignite it to bring the fire back up. So it's a twofold deal. Yeah, we knocked the fire down. Maybe we didn't kill it all the way, but all that water that went into that room is also soaked everything else. So 
the chances of it igniting or getting bigger or slowing it down to that second line or that supply line is late gives us an advantage where it doesn't just take off on us. Water's amazing. Good about that. It's just like a sprinkler. Sprinkler only puts out 23 gallons of water a minute, but it contains the fire. Maybe it doesn't put it out, but everything that's around it is wet. So as the fire tries to travel, it hits a wet substance, it goes out. You know, and then, um, like they were saying earlier, Chief Salk was saying, you go in there and you do something, it slows the progression down. It doesn't keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as he says, you know, 500 gallons or 500 gallons in short first, put it all in there at once. It's a fight. You want to slap the guy twice or hit him one time right in the middle of his nose and walk his eyes and take him to his knees. That's what we're up against, you know, and you have to try to teach these kids that, that that's what we're up against. The faster you can stumble it and take it to his knees, the better the shot we're going to have at. That's a great point. Like John said, like Chief Salka said, if you pull up and don't use your tank water because you're worried about running out of water, you've already run out of water. You have no water. So, hey, guys, you know, we, we went with the title of, you know, the fire tech, knowing your weapon and, and where the water comes from. And we've been hitting all, which we wanted to do, hit all those different areas. Uh, we got a few minutes here. We always try to do this as we wrap up a uh, little insight from, from our guests. Um, and, and I guess, Mark, let me start with you. If you had, you know, if you had advice, you know, you've been, you've been, You've been doing this a long time in Louisville. You're, you're not a rookie by no means. You've been doing this a long time. Um, you're a mentor to a lot of young firefighters that can hire that. I know that. I, I know a lot of young guys that speak very highly of you. If you had a chance, Chief Ashman's, you know, your, your training chief, he says, okay, Marf, I've got these three rookies coming out to you today, you know, and 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 I want you to give them the, your perspective on the importance of their job supporting what it is you do as a driver engineer. I think, um, Chief, a lot of uh, a lot of what I would relay to them, what I would relay to the younger guys coming in, is knowing your district and knowing what water supply capabilities we have within our district. Because our city's divided up, you know, we have we have an old town, we have you know the district I'm in out here that's got a lot of big buildings and stuff. Knowing the types of water mains that we have, knowing knowing the um, the hydrant situation, knowing where our good hydrants are, where our bad hydrants are, that stuff alone and feeding off of the more senior guys and learning what, what they know about the city and what they know about the water situation is huge because you may get a, uh, a bump up uh, or a swing in guy for the day that doesn't necessarily know the district, but it's your district. And if you're a new guy in there, you're going to be expected to know what's going on in that district water supply issues. Um, and that's helping the engineer, uh, knowing your hydrants, um, knowing how to hook it. I mean, knowing that, making sure your hydrants open all the way. I mean, that's the stuff like that, little things like that that, right. that uh, you know, guys don't necessarily pay, may not pay complete attention to, but that can make or break a fire in a hurry. Oh, absolutely, Mark. If if uh, that's a great message. If if somebody want to get a hold of you to pick your brain, or maybe to come out and ride out. I know you guys are still very open to having people come out and visit. Maybe ride out. Um, What's what's an email address for you if they wanted to reach out to you? Uh, M Murphy at cityoflouisville.com. M Murphy at cityoflouisville.com. Perfect, perfect. Ryan, uh, Chief Fetzer, let's uh, closing thoughts from you on this whole fire tech water supply thing. For advice, you know what? Advice for another chief that faces what you have: a couple hydrants and a lot of a lot of dropping water. I say at that point, you really just need to know, you know, all your new guys when you're in a water force situation like we are know what your capacities are on all of your trucks you know whether it's our first new engine our tender our brush trucks and you know, know what your capacity is and make sure all your guys understand the flow rates and how to adjust those flow rates you know all of our trucks have adjustable nozzles on the inch and three quarter lines 60 to 150 gpm that's going to play a big role in doing that initial tack with your tank water well ryan thank you hey, first of all buddy again i'm very partial because i love you guys and i've watched you guys and and you guys are the role models in this area for, for fire departments in general, but especially for what you do with your people. So thanks for what you do. If somebody wanted to get a hold of you, Chief, what's a good email address for you? Email chief at wichitawestfd.org. All right, perfect, perfect. Chief Ashman, my yes, buddy. Okay, the, the, what, what, I'll tell you, and, and, and Bobby, I know you know John Ashman, but John, I, and I've said this, you know I have no problem embarrassing you. I know very few people anywhere in my life. Bill Peters comes to mind because Willie P would, for Bobby is incredible. That knows apparatus specifications, those hydraulics, those flows, those tactics, those water, everything surrounding it. You, it. Just when I was there a short 12 years, I was there. You spent millions of dollars on rigs. 
and I trusted you 100% because you made great decisions to put good rigs together. So, John, thank you. Now I know why the guys love you that you teach to all the time, and you need to be teaching more people. But um, that being said, closing thoughts from you, buddy. And you go back to the first, like they say, uh, as the first five minutes go, so goes the fire. And if you have water supply problems and issues, then it just gets chaotic from there. So, you know, usually it's our youngest guys that, that bring in the water, you know, the med crews or the tailboard guy. You just tell them, don't shortcut it. You know, don't cut yourself short. Make sure the hydrant's open all the way. Make sure you flush it real good that we don't have internal debris that comes up through the system. Make sure you charge the hose slowly so that we don't get massive kinks or the five-inch hose doesn't grow like we know it keeps rolling down the street and we get these massive kinks built in the system. If he's in charge of the intake, open the intake all the way. So now we know we have a full supply of water and then it goes to the driver. Once the first lines are filled off, make sure you know what the residual pressure is. Flow the first couple of lines, mark your residual again. Now you know your percent drops. Do I have enough water at this fire to put this out by doing the, the fire flow calculations? If not, I got to notify command real quick that, hey, we don't have but maybe two, three, 500 gallons left to this thing, and it still requires another 1,000 to put it out. So now command's going to have to go extra alarms, bring more people, and get the water supply system up and going. If the driver waits to the last minute and charges it and then realizes that I can't charge that line, then it puts everybody behind the eight ball. Now you're 15, 20 minutes into this, and now you just now realize you have water issues. So if you go the first part of it, the hydrant, the hose, the intake, percent drop, how much water are we flowing, notify command. It should take care of itself from there. You know, and then as they say, well, water supply issues and this and that. You look at any great big fire, it always goes back to two things I always say, communication and water flow. And they go, you know, you read this case studies and they go, yeah, we laid 2,500 feet of five inch to a four inch main that was 90 years old. <laughs> really? You just now figured out that you have a water supply issue. Now, so again, if we could work those two things out in the very beginning, uh, hopefully the fire goes out real quick for you. And you just mentioned, John, everything that, uh, again, people we've been emphasizing, but another point on you're not just pulling knobs and standing there while they're fighting. You know, you're not just the driver. You're not, you didn't just pump at the fire. You know, I thought that was an awesome point. And I know, I know guys that were notorious for that. And that's what Eddie Edwright, legendary chief in Chicago, wanted to hear from his, his engineers was, you know what, as we're figuring this out, as you're doing your job, you need to turn around and tell me, Chief, I don't think I've got enough. You, you, know, you need to be thinking going on the alarm. You know, I don't think I have enough to, to do what I'm going to do, just what I'm doing. We need to get some other help here. And that's that whole team thing. That's a great point. Chiefs, uh, John, real quick before I forget, email address. If, and I'm telling you to our listeners, you need to get this guy out to teach for you. I'm telling you, um, incredible. You're, first of all, you guys will love him, his demeanor. He's an incredible instructor, but have him out to come out and teach for you. Chief Ashman, if they want to get a hold of you, email address? It's uh, jashman at cityoflouisville.com. Perfect. Thank you, John. Chief Salka, closing thoughts, buddy? Oh, your job. Learn something new every day and train, train, train. I mean, it, that, that's not too difficult, but it, that, that's a mouthful. That's a bunch of stuff. Well, Bobby, Chief Halton. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Wait, John, uh, email address. I always forgot to ask you. Chief Salka? What? Your email address. <laughs> oh, Chief John Salk at gmail.com. Perfect. Chief Halt, closing thoughts, buddy? Uh, two things. <clears throat> First, uh, at FDIC, we've got Stretching for Success with uh, Steve Robinson, a great, uh, great crew of guys and gals that have an incredible class completely around everything we've been talking about, Stretching for Success. Also, Jeff Shoup's class. It's also thematically very close. And awesome hands-on training classes. So if you are interested in this and you're coming to FDIC, uh, it, 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 make sure that you've got yourself into those two programs. Can't go wrong. Robertson's uh, Stretching for Success and Jeff Shoup's uh, Engine Company class. Uh, final thing, Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> well, and I always cheat with this one. Folks, if you're looking to get a whole cheap Bobby Hall, all you got to do is open up the magazine that you should be subscribing to. His contact information is on there at, and, uh, at FDIC.com, at fireengineering.com, at all of them. So reach out to Chief Halton. Uh, I tell you one thing, Bobby, I've said this before. I love it that you can walk down the hallways at FDIC uh, and people can stop you and talk to you and visit with you. And as busy as you are, I know you're crazy busy. You always have time for everybody from the newest guy and gal to the oldest. I can't thank you enough. And 
I want to point some out to my, my, my good buddy, John Salka. Do you see the picture above Bobby's left shoulder? Do you see your favorite president is up there, buddy? Ronnie, baby, Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> Chief McGrath, closing thoughts, buddy. Hey, first of all, I want to call attention to the fact that Chief Salka has a Gmail address now. It's not AOL. <laughs> Gmail. And we all appreciate you for that. I am. I have joined the 20th century. <laughs> No, 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 you haven't. It's a lie. As an editor, I want to I want an official correction. I said 20th. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Uh, John Salter, no. it is absolutely 1920. <laughs> no, Chief, you know what? It, it, it's already been said, and, and, and to echo that is, is to do your job. But you know what? Embrace your job. Everyone wants to be on the nozzle. They want to be the one buried up. They want to come out and high five with insulation and stuff all over them. You know what? Go down and high five that guy that hooked to the hydrant and, and go out there and high five the, the dude that's pumping that fire for you. But, you know, every single job on that fire ground is critical. And it's not, you know, everyone knows Tom Brady's face, but you couldn't, you couldn't pick a lineman out of a, out of a lineup. Uh, but believe me, every single role is critical out there. And whatever your role is, embrace it and 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 be the best at it. I like that. Don't forget, like I said, the importance of the driver engineer, the driver operator. So, hey, we've had a great group here, folks, today. Don't hang up, guys. Uh, we had Chief Ryan Fetzer <laughs> from the Wichita West Fire Department in Texas. We had the town chief, John Aspen, driver engineer, Mark Murphy, and obviously my, my, my co-host for their show uh, every month, Assistant Chief Terry McGrath, all from Louisville. My good, good buddy, Chief John Salka, and I always love it when Chief Halton joins us. Um, guys, thank you so much for don't hang up yet. We'll stay on real quick afterwards for, for coming on today. Uh, we're pretty much all on Facebook and Twitter. Um, like I said, I think Mark unfriended me, but that's okay. We'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so if you need to get a hold of us, you've got our emails at our sites. Um, our next show that, uh, Terry and I'll be here and Bobby pops on there when he can, he travels a lot is March 18th. Uh, fire engineering, we say this all the time, always, always has some great hangouts here on Wednesdays. You get to interact with some awesome people besides the podcast we have in the evening. Uh, there is no excuse to not be connected to the fire department, uh, to the fire service, uh, sorry, to, to what we're doing when you've got that kind of opportunity right there. In closing, and this goes for all of us, uh, we'd like you to keep the men and women serving in our armed forces and your thoughts and prayers and uh, again, especially right now, please keep uh, our, our brothers and sisters in blue on the law enforcement side of our family uh, in your thoughts and prayers as well as uh, they're going through some rough times. But with that, uh, catch us again here. Be safe. God bless you. And thanks for joining us today.